Okay, let's make a start. So um, welcome everyone uh, to this Curly Recovery Partnership session on uh, the Curly Survey Monitoring Guidance. Um, bit of housekeeping, uh, we are recording at the minute, so don't pick your nose, please, if you're on camera. Um, you should all be muted um, for the time being, but we'll have opportunities for, for chat later on. If there's anything that comes up while I'm talking and you want to uh, fix it while it's in your memory, then please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen in the little to toolbar where it says chat. Um, if if not, otherwise, we'll use the opportunity to, I think there's a small enough number that we can do manual hands or use a little um, reactions bar. I'll talk about that later. So there will be plenty of opportunity for Q&A afterwards. So um, yeah, I want this as much to be an opportunity for for people to ask me questions, but we've got a lot of expertise on on uh, tonight. Um, so hopefully we can exchange some some info between ourselves as well. Uh, I'm based down in the New Forest on the south coast, uh, and I'm Russell Wynn. I'm the manager of the Coley Recovery Partnership. And I think it's fair to say that I'm most familiar with uh, recording, monitoring, surveying curlews down here in the New Forest National Park on sort of lowland heathland um, habitat. But I've had the opportunity as CRP manager over the last couple of years to, to visit and uh, talk to and experience curlews in a wide range of different breeding habitats in the in the country. Um, I am glad though tonight that we've got uh, people like Paul Noyes of the BTO um, and, uh, and Kane Brides and Dan Gornall of WWT that are um, really using uh, some of the curly survey and monitoring methods literally on a daily basis and will be for the next few um, weeks and have got a lot of experience so it's, if at times I need to phone a friend uh, I know that I've got some uh, some some good guys on here to help as well and I did yeah I should where's Mike Smart I can dare to not mention Mike Smart in that uh, in that context as well um, I should also acknowledge that although I'm giving the presentation this evening a lot of the work uh, around developing this survey and monitoring guidance for the CRP was led by Jeff Hilton at WWT. Um, Jeff's been at a Curlew and Blacktail Godwit head starting conference in London for the last couple of days, so couldn't be here this evening. Um, but um, he was heavily involved together with a working group of experts to help put together the, the guidance. And, and I think the first thing to say is what I'm going to show you tonight isn't the finished article. We're all learning as we go along with, with Curlew. They're a difficult bird. Um, to survey and we're we're sort of iterating the, the methods as we go but we'll, we'll do the best we can to to give a clear picture of um, what we think is uh, an optimal method um, at the minute so I am now going to go to share screen and let's see if we can get this working go to slide show right can you all see a big picture of a curly give me a thumbs up Good. No, this is a lovely photo by uh, Tom Tom Streeter. So just an intro to the Curly Recovery Partnership. Um, we have a steering group of nine organisations that represent a wide range of, of interests. You can see the, the logos in there, sort of mix of big sort of national NGOs, more Curly specific NGOs. We've got Natural England and, and some representatives of big landowners like Duchy of Cornwall, uh, Bottom Castle Estate. We uh, have been going for about two years. We've just uploaded a blog actually that outlines some of our experience over the first two years of, of the CRP being in existence. We've got a wider network of over 350 uh, CRP members that we're, we're here to try and support uh, and, and things like the survey and monitoring guidance are part of that. And our chair is Mary Colwell and I'm the manager. I'm stepping down in about a month and we've got a new uh, director that will be starting in April, which we'll be announcing soon. And our aims are very simple, try and reverse the decline of curlews, which is not an easy task, uh, connect up curlew conservationists across the country uh, and potentially between countries and to be informed by the um, science and pre present an objective view really around some of the difficult issues in curlew conservation, such as um, predation, forestry, um, etc. So just to give some context for this evening, and just to remind you all really of the importance of curlew in a UK context, we hold about a quarter of the global population of Eurasian curlew. Uh, best estimate is around 58,500 breeding pairs, but a lot of uncertainty around that figure. A lot of the data upon which is that's based are quite old atlas data, which are over a decade old now. About half of those estimated to occur in, in England in the order of 25, maybe 30,000 pairs, but it could be quite a bit lower than that. It's high uncertainty around that. We've got more uncertainty that south of the Pennines in lowland, uh, sort of southern and middle in, in England, we've only got about 500 uh, pairs. 
So they're really uh, hanging on in a few sort of isolated colonies in the, in the south. The, the strength of the population, as you can see in the plot of relative abundance in the last atlas in England, at least is in the Pennine chain, which is that block of red on the uh, map on the left. The population's halved in the last two decades, which is why there's so much conservation effort now being put on the species, together with the international um, importance of the population in, in the UK and England. We know from BTO work that adult survival is pretty good, uh, more than 90% for adults, so that's not really the issue. It's poor productivity that's the issue. It's down at around 0.25 chicks per pair per year, which is about half of where it needs to be for a sustainable population. And things like predation and losses associated with agricultural operations in grassland habitats are, are probably the two key blockers on, on productivity. In some areas, though, habitat loss due to forestry, wetland drainage, peat extraction are important. In Ireland, where the species is facing imminent extinction at, based on current rates, uh, habitat loss has been a, a major driver as well. And if you look at that map on the left, there's possibly as few as 2,000 pairs remaining south of that dogleg black line. So, so most of Wales, most of southern England and, and all of the island of Ireland, um, possibly as few as 2,000 pairs. And if we lose those, we lose about half of the UK and Irish range. Um, so from a CRP perspective, we're committed to maintaining the high populations in the upland areas, um, but also trying to maintain the range by holding on to populations in some of these disparate lowland areas as well. And we have to keep remembering this figure that Graham Appleton uh, produced of you know, 10,000 more chicks per year are needed in the UK to um, just to hit a sustainable, uh, balanced uh, population. Um, so that gives you an idea of the scale of the issue. It's going to have to be big national scale solutions to meet this, this issue. So where does survey monitoring fit into all of this? Well, estimating the number of pairs of curlew and their productivity uh, annually is really the basis for effective curlew um, conservation. And we need those accurate, up-to-date and consistent data to target and test uh, intervention. So if we're going to reverse the decline, we can't just sit there and monitor birds. We need to, to then work out what we're going to do to mitigate what in most cases is, is low productivity, um, uh, disappearing eggs and disappearing chicks. And we want to be able to make useful comparisons between sites across the country and, and potentially between countries. The established methods for monitoring uh, breeding waders that are out there have been used for, for a long time and, and they're mostly good, um, but they're often a compromise because you're dealing with different waders with different um, sort of seasons and habits, uh, particularly in terms of survey timing. So what we found is many groups across the country are using a sort of bespoke approach to, to curly survey monitoring. We're certainly doing a, a, a you know our own thing here in the new forest that wouldn't really fit with some of the current uh, methods. And we're finding that there's an increasing number of groups and individuals now focused on um, curly conservation generally. And so ideally, we want to be able to synthesize data from multiple sites uh, and groups. Importantly as well, there's a lot more focus now on getting productivity. It's a really hard metric to obtain, takes a lot of work, but that's often the key metric that we want to use to guide appropriate interventions. Because if you're in an area one of the few areas and you're very lucky and you've got good productivity, then that's a good sign that, you know, the curlews are doing okay and, 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 and things are probably not too bad. But across most of the country, we've got low productivity, way below where it needs to be. And we need to understand what's driving that. Because in each area, there's often a different set of drivers uh, and, and a sort of one size fits all approach isn't, isn't appropriate, especially when we're dealing with mitigating uh, predators uh, or mitigating agricultural operations. So, so that's some of the background to why. In terms of where, the methods that I'll be talking about tonight and that are in our guidance uh, that you can find online are really designed to be scalable across all landscapes and, and habitat types. Um, so you can see in the image here, you know, you've got everything from, uh, if I use the mouse, um, hopefully you can see that, you know, there's a little uh, farm up in the top right here. This is the uppermost part of the Derwent Valley. Um, and you might be just dealing with one field. Yeah, it may be that you're you're just interested in surveying a, a couple of pairs of curlew in a in a big field as part of your inby attached to your farm, or you might be interested in surveying all of your inby land around your farm, encompassing you know several uh, fields, a few hectares or a few tens of hectares. But you might be interested in looking at a whole catchment like the Upper Derwent Valley and covering a much bigger area. Or you might be looking at a whole upland estate that includes, you know, farms in hand and tenant farms, as well as the upland uh, grouse moor um, that you can see in here, including some of those those sort of upland moorland um, areas. 
So the idea is, is that the guidance should be scalable across all those different um, sizes. And you'll have different population densities in some of the in by more intensive grassland, you might have relatively low density and up on the grouse moor, we've got you know pretty good habitat and, and good predator management, you might have have high densities. So uh, in terms of who, the methods are designed to be accessible to all. So this isn't just for some elite group of hardcore birders, this is meant to be um, you know, methodology that, that everyone can pick up. But I will later on point towards some other methods that um, are also designed to be um, used for people with different circumstances. Um, and we apply a tiered approach. Uh, so again, people can come in and maybe just do the first tier, don't have to do all three, th three tiers. They get more intense in terms of experience and effort as you go through the three um, tiers. So they're suitable for small uh, informal operations that might be led by small groups or individuals, um, sometimes with relatively limited experience, but also suitable hopefully for big projects managed by big ENGOs or, or estates with lots of trained um, field workers, gamekeepers, et cetera. There are other methods of way to monitoring, uh, pull noise, BTOs on here. You can maybe talk more about this later on. That are available for, for folk that are sort of wanting to do a little bit of stuff that they can incorporate into their day-to-day -day works. This might be farmers, might be gamekeepers, things like the BTO wader calendar uh, and the gamekeeper trapline um, surveys are, are also appropriate. And again, you can access those via our website. And it's worth saying that, you know, our guidance might not be suitable or might not be optimal where there's existing projects that have an established way of collecting curly data that are very tailored to their local circumstances and that's been running for several years we don't want people just to drop what they've been doing uh, and start a new methodology because that might break a data set that's providing a good picture of a curly population over over time so we certainly don't want to don't want to interrupt that process um where uh, where it's not needed so in terms of when, uh, part of the reason of having this uh, session tonight is we're just coming into the start of the of the season, really. Um, the first birds are already starting to appear back on many uh, breeding locations, both in the uplands and the lowlands of the, of the country. And migration is starting to, to take place back to breeding grounds, both in the UK and in, in uh, Central and Northern Europe. So in terms of counting the territorial pairs of curlews, um, that really should take place before incubation starts. And so this period from now through to sort of mid-April is, is really a, the key period. And it's quite a wide window there. And that's because this period varies between different sites. And it's not as simple as saying upland sites are, are later than lowland sites. It's really um, quite random. And, and there's probably a, a range of factors that drive it. So. Here in the south, we know that in the Seven and Avon Vales, where Kane and Mike and, and Dan are operating, the birds often come back as early as February. And I'm sure you'll have quite a few back already now in, in the first week of March. Whereas here in the New Forest, we've only had probably one report so far. Uh, and it's probably related to the fertility of the land and the food availability and, and proximity to the coast and wintering sites and all sorts of things. So, But generally, the period from now through to mid-April is the time when you want to be counting your territorial pairs of curlews before they start settling down to to nest and generally our guidance is to reduce effort when the birds are nesting and this is mostly in the period from sort of mid to late april through to about early june and again it varies a little bit between between locations the reason for doing this is a curlews are extremely hard to find when they're nesting uh, and we want to minimize disturbance uh, when they're nesting as well. So there'll be a small number of groups that will be specifically going in and doing specialist work, looking for nests and monitoring nests. But that has to be done uh, under strict conditions. But for, for most folk uh, engaging in this survey and monitoring, you don't need to find the nest. And that period when the birds are nesting is, is, is really not a good time to be going, going after them for a whole number of, of reasons. Then ideally to monitor the productivity, which is you know, how many uh, chicks are they producing, uh, we'd ideally recommend that people undertake fairly frequent, timed and rather short repeat visits uh, to focus on adult behaviour rather than necessarily finding chicks because that can be very challenging. And the peak period for that runs from June through to uh, late July and in some cases early August. And it's worth saying here that uh, curlews they normally only have one nesting attempt, but if they uh, if their nest is predated and the eggs are taken quite early in the nesting attempt, and if the female's in condition, uh, they'll often have another go. Uh, and it will take the female a little while to produce another clutch of eggs. And so those second uh, brood birds, if they are successful the second time around, uh, the fledging often won't happen until August. Uh, and so that's something to, to bear in mind as well when it comes to looking at productivity visits. 
So just to stress, in most cases, there's no need uh, to generally do survey monitoring to prove breeding, hatching or fledging by finding the actual nests or chicks. So that reduces the time requirement. Uh, and I say it reduces the need for other checks and balances um, that are associated with going in and doing interventions at the nest. Ideally, we'd prefer that people avoid the immediate post-dawn uh, and pre-dust periods because you tend to get big spikes in activity then, which could bias the results. Although we recognize that in some areas, factors such as recreational pressure uh, may require people to get out fairly early before um, sites get impacted by um, uh, recreation and, and other things. So that's a little bit about the when. In terms of the what, uh, the first key metric we're looking for is the number of apparently occupied territories. So broadly, how many breeding pairs are there in a predefined um, study area? And it's important to sort of define the area that you're looking at before you start work, uh, although it can be modified as you, as you go along. Um, and, and, and those pairs include pairs that are holding territory, but not necessarily breeding, but particularly those that are breeding, whether it be successful or, or unsuccessful um, breeding. The ideal productivity metric in a perfect world is the number of fledglings per occupied territory or per pair. Um, but more practically, there are other ways in which we can get indices of, of, of productivity because we recognise that to get that figure of fledglings per pair is, is really, really difficult, um, even for experienced field workers who've, who've been operating for, for a long time. Um, we propose a three-tier method um, as follows. So. Tier one is, is very simple and it's really um, fairly ad hoc informal visits to potential curly sites. Um, some of those might be sites where there's known activity uh, and has been recorded in the past. Others might be sites where the habitat looks good, but it's not known whether there's curly there. Um, and they need to be during that territory establishment period between now and sort of mid, uh, mid to late April. And this really gives a general picture of site um, occupancy. So, you know, are there curlews on a site? Roughly, where are they? Um, and and if if you just want to do that first step and and you're just starting out on this journey, that might be all that you you want to do um, this season or in future seasons. Just get a rough idea of where the curlews are uh, and are they there at all. I'm not going to go into the detailed methods under each tier, otherwise we'll be here all night. But as I say the guidance is online. You can you can go and have a look at it after this and use that as a as a guide. But generally for tier one. That's what it's about. It's just establishing, you know, our curlews on site and roughly where are they? Now that can provide a good basis to then move on to tier two, which comprises at least two formal standardized visits um, a week or ten, a couple of weeks apart, ideally, during that pre-incubation phase. So over the next sort of six to eight weeks or so, and, and the idea of that is to estimate the number of territorial pairs in the area that you've you've defined. Um, and there's different ways, depending on your landscape of, of, of doing this, whether it's vantage point or, or, or moving through your, your landscape. And again, we provide some flexibility because we recognize that you know, different landscapes probably require very different approaches. If you're looking at a, you know, a complex of fields with lots of dry stone walls and nice compartmentalized sites, um, you might approach that in a different way to a big open moorland fringe or, or lowland heathland type, type habitat. So once you've done tier two, um, that's a good basis for working out well, how many pairs of curlews have I got in my, my area. That can then provide a basis if you want to move on to tier three, uh, which is really trying to get a, a, an idea of what your productivity is like. So tier three is uh, formal standardized visits, um, hopefully as, as many as you can manage um, over the sort of period from June through to potentially as, as into August, separated uh, by no more than about a week uh, to 10 days. Um, to sites to estimate the number of broods that have um, got chicks uh, and hopefully successfully are, are fledging a few chicks. Yeah, you know, it's worth saying that again, outside of um, areas where there's significant protection provided, like nature reserves where there's nest fences or upland um, uh, grouse moors where there's a lot of predator management, the general productivity in this country is very low. You know, it's down around 0.1 to 0.2 chicks per pair. Most pairs are failing. So do not expect if you're starting out on this journey to go into a curly population and find loads of chicks running around in, in June, July. Um, it can be a little bit despondent. That said, they are uh, very elusive. Um, and so sometimes it will take multiple visits to a site to work out whether there's chicks there at all. And I'm sure all of us that have been doing this for a while can vouch for the fact that you can go to a site two, three, four times uh, in July 
uh, and not hear a squeak. Uh, and then you go back in the last week of July thinking, well, this is the last one I'm going to do here because it looks like it's all gone dead. And then suddenly you find there's a pair of curlews there or there's a single curlew left with you know, a couple of chicks, well-grown chicks that have somehow uh, evaded you. Uh, and that happens to people of all experience levels and just shows how elusive and sometimes mobile um, they can be. So those are the um, three tiers. So in terms of uh, recording, one of the key things to do is to retain all of your raw data, um, all of your, your records. Um, we have, so the WWT guys have provided, and thanks to Dan, uh, this all recording form that they use as a template. And I think we'd probably be happy to, to share that amongst members of the network. Um, Dan, shake or nod. Um, uh, but this has been set up for WWT working in the Seven and Aiden Vale. So each area might want to, to sort of you know, set up a recording form uh, as they see fit. But I think we'll probably certainly look to put that WWT one online um, soon as a, as a potential template. So it gives people an idea of what to, to look for. Um, importantly, retain all those raw data because it allows other people um, to, to scrutinize the records and, and, and look at how the interpretation has gone in terms of the number of pairs and, and what defines each territory. Sometimes it's quite a gray area. But importantly, we're learning all the way uh, as we go along with these methods and they will be um, iterated over time. So it allows us to go back in, in you know, future years and, and look at data um, and reanalyze it if appropriate, if, uh, if the methodology and the analysis methods change. For all of the tiers, the sort of standard data that we're looking for, um, it's not rocket science, so, you know, observe the name, date, start, finish time, um, the location of any birds. So ideally, you know, we'd want to get GPS um, fixes or ordnance survey, um, certainly six figure, preferably eight, eight figure, 10 figure grid refs if possible. So it's worth familiarizing yourself with ordnance survey um, grid references and using um, uh, GPS. Uh, number of birds. I'll come on to sex and curlews in a minute. Um, it's not always that easy telling what's male and what's female, um, but it but it can be done with a bit of experience and, and careful observation. Behaviour, I'll talk about in a minute, and, uh, and particularly movements. So, you know, quite often curlew are mobile uh, at all different stages of the season for different reasons. And so locating uh, birds and then recording any movements that you see both within the area that you're looking at and outside or birds coming from outside into that area is, is really important to then later interpret what's what's going on. So really recording as much of you, as, you, as you can when you see it is, is, is great and it helps interpretation later. And the kinds of behaviours you might want to be looking at, um, feeding, uh, birds that are loafing and roosting. Um, early in the season, we often get communal roosting going on. Uh, during the nesting period, you often see an off-duty bird that will be loafing around and, and almost sort of day roosting, napping. Um, commuting flights uh, in and out of the, the territory, um, display, courtship, copulation, all good indicators that you've got a, a pair um, establishing territory or on territory uh, and associated vocalizations. And I'll point you towards a couple of resources where things like vocalizations can be um, uh, listened to and learned um, even before you go out in the, in the field. There is a need to then at the end of the season, when you're looking at your data, work out which curly records relate to territorial pairs and which ones relate to migrants. So particularly early in the season, sort of this time of year um, through to, to April, but in some cases, you know, uh, through into early May, you know, curly are migrating. And a lot of the birds that we get in this country and passing the, through this country will be heading towards places like Finland, um, where there's probably the highest concentration of birds on a, on a European scale. A lot of our wintering birds are from areas like Finland, but also from some of the low countries like Holland and uh, Germany. So we need to make sure that we've uh, eliminated those migrating birds as far as is practical. You're never going to capture all of them uh, and assign all of them correctly. And equally, estimating which curly records relate to which territory uh, in different areas is also sometimes quite challenging where you've got lots of birds at high density uh, and they're quite mobile birds as well. So that can be challenging as well. There is a tendency for new recorders to overestimate the number of pairs in an area because of that mobility. So again, that's just something to bear in mind and where you know, having careful records and careful observation really, really helps. And then really at the end of the season, it's using all of the collected data but this will firm up as you go along through the season to drive an estimate of the number of sites occupied by territorial pairs, which is really a, an objective of tier one. Uh, the actual estimated number of your territorial pairs, which is an objective of tier two. 
um, and then the number of territorial pairs that you see with chicks and, and hopefully some uh, pulling right through to, to the fledging stage, uh, which is what we're after for, for tier three. So I thought it'd be helpful just to put a few uh, pictorial examples things. There's been a lot of text and, and chat there. So I thought I'd put some nice images of Cody's in, but just to illustrate some of the things that we might be looking for through the season. So this time of year, you know, very early in the season, sometimes you'll only find one birds come back to a territory. They don't necessarily winter together or they probably rarely uh, winter together. So often one bird will come back before the other bird and you'll just see one bird sort of hanging around in an area. Often early in the season as well, they don't spend long in the territory. They'll just come back, have a look around, particularly if the partner bird's not there, and then they'll go off somewhere else again. Over time, over the next few weeks, we'll start to see the pairs coming back, um, reaffirming their, their pair bonds. They're often um, uh, faithful to each other. Um, if they both survive the winters, they'll often come back to the same territory and, and sort of greet and meet each other. And then you'll see the pairs sort of walking around. Uh, or flying about in in sort of little semi display, following each other type type flights, and what you'll see here, there's a pair of curlew on the ground upper left, where because of the angle of the photo, it's not that easy to tell which is the male and the female. Um, if I had to guess on that one, I'd say it's probably the male on the left, female on the right. The female on the right looks a bit bigger bodied, uh, which she normally is compared to the male, uh, and a bit longer build. But I think it's a bit easier to see in the photo of the two birds in flight, uh, bottom right. Uh, where I'd be pretty confident that the upper bird of the two in flight is the female, uh, the one with the bill slightly open, slightly bigger bodied bird, longer bill compared to the male, um, slightly smaller and a slightly shorter bill trailing behind. But I think you can see there that it's quite, quite subtle. But knowing which is the male and the female sometimes can help with interpreting what's going on. If you've obviously got two birds that look identical in size and bill uh, length running around together, that could be two males having a bit of a territorial dispute or something like that. Um, which you wouldn't want to record as a, as a pair. Um, I put this in just to remind me to ask you all, you know, there's an increasing number of birds out there now with colour rings on and also with um, uh, satellite or uh, light logging uh, transmitters on. So so please, when you see curlews coming back into your area, particularly early in the season, uh, before the grass gets too long, before the vegetation gets too long, it's a really good time to look for colour rings on the legs of the birds. Um, and also keep an eye on the back in case there's anything on the back. Um, and if you do see one with uh, colour rings on, um, then feel free to contact me. Um, but there's also, if you search online for colouring birding, uh, you'll quickly get pointed to the right place to report those. I think there is a job to do to get better coordination of the various colouring schemes. Some of them are associated with head starting, some of them associated with winter uh, colour ringing at the coast. Um, there's a lot of curly colouring going on at the minute, and it can be confusing knowing where to send the um, data. So that's something that I hope the CRP can provide some guidance and coordination of in, in due course. But yeah, please look out for colourings. Please look out for any birds that are carrying tags on the back. And if they're carrying a tag on the back of some sort, they'll almost invariably be colouring. So once you get into the um, sort of nesting stage, you generally only see one bird at a time. So one bird will be on the nest incubating the eggs. And what we call the off-duty bird uh, will, in some cases, be in the territory, skulking around or, or, or loafing. But often the off-duty bird will fly uh, not just a few hundred meters away, but sometimes kilometers away. Um, here in the New Forest, sometimes the off-duty birds go down to the nearby um, Solent Coast uh, to go and forage because there's lots of good feeding there compared to on the open um, forest. So. So the off-duty bird may be somewhere completely different to, to, to where the nest is. So you might turn up at a nest site and if you've got an incubating bird and, and you don't know where the nest is and the off-duty bird is off the territory, it will just look like there's nothing there. And it's quite easy to think, oh, well, they failed or there's, they're not nesting here this year. So that's one of the reasons why this nesting period is just really difficult. They're not vocalizing much. If you're very lucky and you happen to be in the vicinity of when they're changing over at the nest, you'll occasionally hear a bit of calling. For those of you that have been listening into Curlew Cam, hosted by our colleagues at Curlew Country, and I know there was a Northern Ireland equivalent, and, and I'm sure we'll see one or two more of these popping up because um, they're really good sort of outreach mechanisms. When you watch that Curlew Cam, that Curlew on the nest, you know, it's surprising how often they will vocalise, but it's quite quiet when they're doing the changeover at the nest. And if you're more than, you know, maybe a few tens of metres away, you probably wouldn't pick it up. So generally that nesting phase, the birds are very quiet. They're very skulky. 
And to give a couple of examples, this female in the top image was one in the new forest that had been pushed off the nest deliberately by me as I was doing nest intervention work. And again, this is all done under, under the appropriate permits and licenses. Um, but you can see she's quite low to the ground. She knows why I, where I am. Uh, there was the off-duty male quite nearby, and she was just calling very quietly to him just to say, you know, there's something going on here, I'm a bit alarmed. Uh, but often they'll just run tangentially off through the vegetation um, as you approach the nest, uh, so it looks like there's no sign of any bird there at all. Um, and then you're just left having to hunt for some very well camouflaged eggs on the ground, which is is, is really difficult. The lower image is a typical image of, of a sort of off-duty bird, often sitting in quite a prominent location, um, so they can keep an eye on the territory, keeping an eye on, on any potential predators or, or people approaching in the vicinity of the nest. Um, so if you come into a territory and you see a bird sitting around like that in a prominent location on a dry stone wall or something like that, um, then that might well be an off-duty bird if it's in that sort of period from late April through to early June. And it may mean that there's a nesting bird out of sight somewhere, somewhere nearby. So there's some of the kinds of things you might want to be looking out for during the, the nesting phase. But another thing to stress, and again, one of the reasons why, unless it's absolutely necessary as part of a dedicated study, not to go in looking for the nest is always be aware of what's going on around you in the field. So, so it's not just you that are looking for those curlews. There'll be predators, diurnal predators, such as corvids, um, birds of prey. Some of those will know the ground that you're walking on. They might have an inkling that there's a, a pair of curlew in there. Uh, and, and all it needs is for one person or a dog running off a path to flush the bird off the nest inadvertently. And that can reveal the location of the nest to a predator. So, so any work you are doing in that nesting period in and around where the birds are and during the chick rearing period, always be very cognizant of what's around you in terms of potential predators. Uh, and if you are at all concerned and you've got any doubts that your activities might be giving away the location of a nest or chicks to a potential predator, then back off um straight away so the last thing you want to be doing is alerting predators to potential nest sites or or, or young um, chicks so just be aware always of, of what's around you in most cases the curlews will know long before you again those of us that have been doing it for a while you know that classic head tilt where the curlew is looking at something in the sky and you're seeing looking at you know a blank piece of sky for quite a while and then suddenly you might see a buzzard that looks like it's a mile up it's an absolute dot and the curlews will always pick them up before before you will um, I just put this in to uh, remind myself to say, again, off-duty birds, they might be a long way away from the territory. As so here in the New Forest Isles go down to the adjacent coast, uh, quite a long way from, from some of the territories. Um, and they can be they can be very mobile. It's also worth noting here that, again, when they've got chicks, they can be remarkably mobile as well. Um, certainly, we've got records in the new forest of birds moving up to a kilometre in 24 hours with chicks through some you know, quite difficult terrain. Um, so, again, keeping track of birds can be quite difficult. So high mobility is a known issue around curlew um, survey and monitoring and something that we always have to be, be cognizant of. Just because you see a bird in one field and a bird maybe later in the same morning in another field that's you know a kilometre away doesn't mean they're not the same bird and it could have just moved quietly between two different two different fields. What we tend to find is that early in the season the mobility is quite high the pairs often ranging over a big area and then as we get through uh, March and into April as they approach nesting they'll start to home in on a smaller and smaller area uh, which will be the area where they're likely to nest. Um, so as you go through the next six to eight weeks, you can start to get greater confidence of where a likely nest site is going to be and where a territory is centred by the fact that the birds will spend more and more time in that, that area. And just in the preliminary period before nesting, you'll start to see other behaviours. Uh, they might start tossing grass up in the air and doing a few other um, strange things, which might give you a good indication that, that nesting is imminent. So if you're seeing things like copulation, grass being thrown up in the air, birds hanging around in a very specific area for long periods, that's often a good sign that they're going to settle down quite close to that, that area. Um, during the chick rearing phase, um, I mentioned, uh, yeah, when you're going into an area, if, if they're um, guarding chicks and you come sometimes even within a few hundred metres of where those chicks are, one or both of the birds will get up and start giving me a sort of agitated alarm call, a bit like this bird on the left. 
Um, so you don't necessarily need to go, you know, tramping through fields, looking through through chick for chicks. You can just look at the adult behavior. But also, um, often they'll respond to predators. So there's an image there of a fox approaching a, a, a curlew, and the curlew is keeping a very close eye on it because it's got chicks hidden nearby. Uh, and in the bottom right, there's a curlew going up and mobbing a buzzard, again, defending um, chicks that were hidden on the ground. So, so when you come onto a site, often the, the birds will give themselves away um, by alarming because of your presence. Certainly here in the in the new forest, yeah, if I get to within three or hundred, three, four hundred meters of some pairs with chicks, one of the birds will get up and come over and start um, alarming at me. Uh, it does vary between different sites and landscapes, but just sitting in the in the uh, area for a while um, and just seeing if birds respond to any predators in an area like carrion crows flying over or, or raptors uh, or a day hunting fox or something is a good way to say, OK, they're behaving in a way that tells me that they're defending chicks. Generally, if they failed um, either at the egg stage and if they haven't uh, started a second attempt, uh, they won't start a third. They're not capable of, of doing that. Um, generally, if they failed either at the egg or the chick stage, both birds will abandon the territory quite soon afterwards. They sometimes hang around looking a bit forlorn for a few days, uh, but generally they go. So if you get into June and certainly if you're into July um, and you've got birds that are still on site uh, and they're doing things like this alarming, uh, either at your predators, that's a really good sign that they've got chicks. So they've successfully hatched, they've got chicks. So you can say, okay, that pair, um, they've got chicks. You don't even have to see the chick, you're just using the adult behavior as a, as a proxy. Obviously, if you're very fortunate, uh, it's another lovely photo by, by Tom Streeter, uh, you might get to see the chicks. Um, but again, this is really difficult and we would certainly discourage people, again, unless it's part of a dedicated stu study, trying to go and find chicks in fields. Um, it's really, really hard. You always risk trampling the chicks because often they'll just go to ground rather than running away. And unfortunately, that's one of the reasons why they're prone to getting um, caught up in, in um, harvesting machinery in grassland landscapes. Um, so often you can do more harm than good by um, going in and um, looking for chicks in an area. So generally, when you get small chicks like this and the vegetation's grown up, it's very unlikely you'll actually see the, the chicks. I don't have expectations of, of getting views like this. That's the exception rather than the, the norm. Um, but later in the season, um, as the chicks grow up, uh, you can see this image of the right of one on the ground. ground. Um, so it's just about at fledging age. It's got a little bit of downy feathering. The bill is still very short, but the bird on the ground is the same bird that is the one in flight uh, on the left. So, so this is about the earliest at which you'll see them able to take flight, where the wings have developed enough that they can get off the ground. Um, but you can see there that almost looks more like a rough in terms of the, the bill length and things. doesn't look anything like a, a curlew. But that effectively is a fledged chick. So that's a tick in the box. You know, I've seen a fledged chick. That's great. Um, and uh, and if you can do that, that's ideal. But to see that, you're going to have to keep plugging away and visiting your site into July and in some cases into, um, into August. So just a few thoughts before we open it up for, um, for, for Q&A. First thing to say is no method is perfect, uh, and the guidance that we're um, providing um, is a compromise, um, as are all such methods. Uh, and our guidance is likely to undergo further iteration, both you know in the coming weeks and in in, in future years. So so it is only guidance, um, and there will be always local conditions that dictate the best way of doing things. But hopefully, it provides a, a, a useful um, starting point for for folk and encourages people to move towards methods that can be standardized as far as is um, practicable. Um, second thing to say is curly conservation is a long game. We're under no illusions in the Curly Recovery Partnership that we're not going to turn curlews around in the next year or two. This is going to be decadal um, if we achieve it at all. And it's likely to be patchy in some areas we may achieve it, in other areas we may not um, for different reasons. And survey monitoring isn't, isn't any exception to that. So you know, the breeding season extends from now, so we're in early March, right through to July and um, in some cases into August, particularly where you've got second brood, um, second breeding attempts or birds. Uh, and one of the key things to say is that if you're a volunteer or a volunteer coordinator, you know, we often get what we call the enthusiasm spike, uh, which tends to sort of peak in around uh, late March, early April, when most of the birds are back on territory. Everyone's really buoyed up, really enthusiastic. You're going onto your site and there's birds flying around all over the place, calling, noisy. Um, and, and, and those of us that are used to seeing low productivity, I think maybe this will be the year we get a few chicks away and it will all be great. 
So you get this sort of spike in, in optimism uh, early in the season and everyone's very keen and doing their visits very diligently. And what we tend to see is that enthusiasm starts to wane as a, yeah, we lose quite a lot of pairs at the uh, egg stage, at the nest stage, because they get predated or, or moan. So here in the new forest, we lose anything from half of the nests um, uh, roughly you know, at the egg stage. So that's half of our birds are gone, uh, normally by, by something like mid-June, late June, something like that. And then through July and August, it's quite attritional because often we see when the chicks first hatch, they're most prone to predation in those first few days just after they've hatched. So we often get a very sharp drop off in activity um, as we go through the first or half of July, something like that. So it can be a bit discouraging when you started off maybe with you know 40 pairs like we do in the new forest and you get to second half of J July and we might only have three, four of those pairs that are still live, still active. Um, and I say it's not the adults that we're losing, it's the eggs and the and the chicks. But you know, every chick is precious. Monitoring productivity as accurately as possible is really important for, for them working out what to do around interventions. And so the one thing I would say, if there was one thing that was a key message, it would be keep plugging away at your sites into July and in some cases into August if you've got any suspicious that, suspicions that birds might still be around or that they uh, relayed after a, a, a failure because that will give you greater confidence at the end of the season that, yeah, I really did keep checking and there really wasn't any evidence of any chicks there. But you'd be surprised how often in second half of July suddenly a pair pops up with a, a, a couple of chicks in tow that you just missed. Uh, and that can make all the difference between having a totally dud season and actually you've actually got a, two or three chicks away. Um, but often to get to that stage of, of um, knowledge of what's going on in your territories um, and whether they're productive or not, it's often a three to five year period. So don't expect to do all this in year one. You build up layers of knowledge year on year on year. And I'd say typically from scratch, you're looking at three to five years to get a really good grip of your population and what its productivity is like. So typically for a local curly group, you'll, you'll set yourselves up. You want to get permission from all your landowners. You want to work out what's the area that you're looking at. And then you might go in and start saying, well, which areas are occupied with breeding curlews? And you might get a rough idea of where they are. You might start mapping them out, get an idea of how many territories you've got if you start moving on to, to tier two. Uh, and then you say, right, that's OK. Now, are they productive? Are they producing young? So then you need to start going and, and looking at productivity under tier three. And then the next stage is to say, well, I found I've got, you know, 20 pairs, but they're only producing two or three chicks a year. That's not good enough. What's the problem? And that's where you need to move to the next level, which is monitoring nests with things like nest cameras um, and other interventions. And then once you've identified what the problem is, you then need to try and mitigate it by doing things like nest fencing and, 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 and other um, methods, habitat manipulation, predator management, et cetera. But all of that survey monitoring provides the evidence base to then inform the intervention. If you're if you're engaging with your local farmer and saying, actually, could you delay cutting a bit? Because we know there's a curlew that nest in this field and they'll probably nest here again this year. Um, you want to have an evidence base to back that up. If it's, again, a farmer that's looking to, to access agri-environment money, if you know down the line we get good uh, options that are financially attractive enough to encourage farmers to do that, again, we need that evidence base. Where are the curlews? Which fields are they using? How many there are? If we're going to start doing uh, lethal predator control or even non-lethal predator control with nest fencing, we need to know where the nest, what's the productivity like, what are the predators, because in each area it's going to be different. So all of this information helps us get to the ultimate goal, which isn't monitoring the number of birds. It's actually monitoring the number of birds and then saying what are we going to do about any issues that they're um, experiencing. That's really why we want people to be doing this. Um, and it's just worth saying, you know, curlew are not the easiest of birds to survey um, while they're they're nesting and chick rearing. And so that idea of having these repeat visits within and across multiple seasons are usually required to build an accurate picture. So just a bit of expectation um, management there. They are a tricky bird to work on. Um, further details of the guidance and, and the details under each tier uh, are on our website um, on, on the resources page. But importantly, there's links to some of those other resources. So I mentioned the BTO Wader calendar. So again, that's a good one for time-pressed farmers and other practitioners that, that want to do something. And also in sites where you might have a, a wider guild of waders than just curlews, you might have lapwing, redshank, snipe um, in, in your area as well. 
And then Coley Country, there's a link to a Coley observation training film that's got some nice video of some of the behaviours and the vocalisations that I talked about today. So again, if you're, if you're relatively new to this, I definitely recommend having a look at that because it gives you a good feel for the kinds of things you might want to be looking for at different stages of the season. And it's there also to go back to if you see something and you think, what does that mean? Uh, you can go back and have a look at that video and, and, and see what it relates to. And if Curly Cam is running again this year, um, either by Curly Country or I think RSPB Northern Ireland ran one last year. I'm sure they'll be running it again. Again, really good just to go and look at what the birds on the nest are doing. Um, and, and if you're lucky enough to see a changeover, I often have it running in the background when I'm working on the laptop because inev inevitably when there's a changeover, you hear a little bit of calling, a little bit of stuff going on. So you get hours and hours, nothing happens. And then, yeah, you hear a changeover coming and you just flick back onto your um, online screen and you can see the changeover, which is is really nice. Um, the CRP website, we also host the Curly Field Worker Toolkit, um, and that contains lots of useful fact sheets on things like Curly ID, vocalisation, behaviour, basic field craft, liaising with the land managers, um, and reducing disturbance when you're doing um, field work. And there's a set of more advanced um, fact sheets that are, are behind a firewall, which is effectively me, uh, which around the nest interventions where we do like to see evidence that people have got the right permits, licenses, permissions, experience, etc. before they go in and do the, the nest intervention work. Um, and finally, just say, yeah, we're here to support you through the process. Um, yeah, it's not just me, it's a good team of, of, of folk around me, both on the CRP steering group and in our various partners. Um, I can be contacted by phone or email at any time via the CRP website. Um, uh, but please don't hesitate to uh, email or call if you've got questions or you need a bit of support through the season and we'll do our best to um, to, to help you out. Um, so another nice photo by Tom Streeter to finish. Uh, there's my email, hello at kellyrecovery.org and all of the resources uh, that I've mentioned um, can be found on the CRP uh, website at the link below. So that's uh, 50 minutes or so, that's enough um, chat from me. I'd like now just to open up to questions. So I'm going to stop sharing.